inside right now. <laughs> hey, uh, do me a favor really quick, a little unorthodox, but turn to the person next to you and say, hey, I'm really glad that you're alive and I'm really glad that you're here right now. Yeah. Glad you're alive and you're here right now. Glad you're alive and you're here right now. That's called love, that's called unity, right? We're here for unity, right? We're here to make sure that we value every single person. Every single person. <laughs> Every single one of us is a child of God. Every it's single one of us is deserving It's okay. To be seen and heard we don't go a lot God. either. We had to kind of make ourselves. I'm glad we Amen. did. We needed a change tonight. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, listen, I'm not going to take too much time, but I did want to just give you a little context for why Shazam is standing here talking to you about these various things. Uh, I grew up in my family, uh, Christian conservative. That was pretty much kind of the, the lane that we were in. My parents were Kennedy Democrats that then turned into Reagan Republicans. And they taught me to have a healthy level of distrust for the government. <laughs> and, <laughs> and a healthy level of distrust for industry that runs amok. And for a long time, I was like, man, I really want to find a politician that represents all of the things that I want and I want to see in a presidential candidate. And this year, I found Bobby Kennedy. And I thought, man, this guy... <laughs> And in a perfect world, whatever that would look like, perhaps I would have voted for Bobby. But we don't live in a perfect world. In fact, we live in a very broken one. We live in a country that has been hijacked by a lot of people who want to take this place way off the cliff. And we're here to stop that, right? We're here to make sure that we are. Woo, 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 we are woo. going to make it again. We're going to make it healthy again. And so I stand with Bobby, and I stand with Tulsi, and I stand with everyone else who is standing with President Trump. Because I do believe that of the two choices that we have, and we only have two, Donald Trump, President Trump, is the man that can get us there. And he's gonna get us there because he's gonna have the backing and the support and the wisdom and the knowledge and the fight that exists in Robert Kennedy Jr. and former Representative Tulsi Gabbard. So please, let's welcome them to the stage right now. jump into and endorse President Trump in what this presidency will, will be. Okay. Should I start? Okay. Um, what I, a gentleman, huh? <laughs> um, I, you know, I, it was a t very, very tough evolution. My, my uh, family came over in 1848 during the potato famine, and the Democratic Party met them on the dock in Boston when they had no money, um, and no, no job, and no home, and it got the most. And my family has been in the Democratic Party ever since, and people generally know the history of my family. And leaving that party was heartbreaking for me. But the party that I grew up with, uh, the party of John F. Kennedy and uh, Robert Kennedy doesn't exist anymore. In fact, there's been a complete inversion. The party that I grew up with was the party of peace, 
My father ran for president against the Vietnam War. President Kennedy never sent a combat troop abroad to die during his administration. He told his best friend the primary job of a president of the United States is to keep the country out of war. Today, the Democratic Party is the party of war, and the Republican Party is the party of peace. I was so proud of President Trump this week when he did that press conference with Zelensky. And a week before, you had all the Democrats signing artillery shells, shells that are going to hit women and children in other counties. And that we've spent $208 billion. We sent them another $8 billion this week. $5 billion would purchase a nice home for every homeless veteran in America. And we'll talk about these issues elsewhere, but the Democratic Party I grew up with was the party of civil rights, of constitutional rights, of freedom of speech, particularly the First Amendment. Today is the party of censorship and surveillance. The Democratic Party that I grew up with was the party of women's sports. My uncle, Ted Kennedy, wrote Title IX to make sure that women had an equal shot to men in colleges. The Democratic Party today is not the party of women's sports. The Democratic Party was a party that was skeptical of the domination of our government by corporate power. Today, the Democratic Party is a party of big pharma, big tech, big ag, big food, the military industrial complex, Wall Street, and, uh, and it's the party of Dick Cheney and John Bolton. These are, it's a party that I absolutely do not recognize. These are the guys who wrote the Patriot Act. They introduced surveillance and censorship for our country. They got us into the Iraq War, the worst catastrophe, foreign policy catastrophe in American history. And Bolton and Cheney, 225 other neocons, have now endorsed Kamala Harris. They didn't endorse her because their opinion about those things has changed. They endorsed her because the Democratic Party now stands for the values of Dick Cheney. And, uh, and it, it, I, that can't be my party anymore. And Quality characters, characteristics, values, principles that Bobby just described of the Democratic Party he grew up in was what drew me to join the Democratic Party when I was 21 years old. Um, it's interesting to see how unrecognizable that party is today uh, and how that once Big Ten open party, Big Ten party that welcomed people from different backgrounds, different views, different ideas, encouraged discussion and debate and dialogue around all of the different issues and still were able to leave rooted in our grounding and founding principles that are enshrined in the Constitution just does not exist anymore. The first, um, the reason that I ran for Congress was largely motivated by the experiences that I had had as a soldier deployed to the Middle East. I was in a medical unit serving in Iraq in 2005. And it was there that I was, first of all, it changed my life. It changed my worldview because I experienced firsthand and saw firsthand the cost of war and who pays the price. I saw for exactly the American people. I saw firsthand the war profiteering that goes on by the military industrial complex firsthand. Uh, who's, who here has heard of Halliburton? Yeah. Who here knows how closely associated Dick Cheney is to Halliburton? Yeah. In our camp in Iraq, we're about 50 miles north of Baghdad, every single thing from porta potties to trash cans. Guess what branded label was on there? KBR Halliburton. 
I used to, you know, we made friends. We had a, a unit of, of soldiers from across uh, Hawaii and the Pacific, and you know, we bring our aloha with us everywhere. And so we made a lot of friends with the workers, the contractors who were hired to work on those camps and these different jobs, the drivers, the people who picked up the trash and so forth. And on the weekends, we'd have little cookouts in the back of our tents with them. And we asked them, how much are you making? And very often what we found was they were making like subpar wages, 500 bucks a month. People who came from the Philippines, Sri Lanka, Nepal, all of these other countries making 500 bucks a month, working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And when you take how much they are getting paid with the hundreds of billions of dollars that we know companies like KBR Halliburton were making, it was absolutely disgusting. I ran for Congress and later ran for president in 2020 because I left that deployment and the one that followed wanting to be in a position where I could help bring back the Democratic Party of President Kennedy, where I could make those decisions related to war and to peace and to how my brothers and sisters in uniform were treated when they came home. Within six months of my being in Congress, I was elected in 2012, President Obama made an announcement that he wanted to seek authorization from Congress to go and start another regime change war in the Middle East, this time in Syria. I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee at the time. Again, I'd been in Congress maybe six months, freshman Democrat. I did my research, I listened to their briefings, then it was Secretary of State Kerry who was coming to our committee and making their case. And they failed to answer even the most basic questions, and this is directly connected to the failures of the Harris-Biden administration. The first thing that you have to ask and be able to answer before you go on a mission is what? What is your objective? What are you trying to accomplish? What does winning look like? What's your exit strategy? These are things that, that you probably think of when you're, you know, you're, you're making decisions in your own lives. What are you trying to accomplish? They couldn't answer those questions. When I asked, they said, oh, we want to go deliver a punch in the gut, send a message. I said, what happens when they deliver a punch back? Oh, they won't do that. I, I did my due diligence. I announced that I would be opposing President Obama's request to go and start another war. And in less than 24 hours, I got a call from the White House. And it wasn't a call saying, hey, Tulsi, we just wanted to see what questions you had or figure out why you oppose this so strongly. What they said was, how dare you? How dare you stand against your president? How dare you stand against, uh, as a freshman Democrat, your president who is from your home state of Hawaii? They didn't care about the substance. They didn't care about the experiences that I was bringing and the voices that I was bringing to light of those who I served alongside and those who were killed in combat and never came home. This speaks to the dangerous mindset of today's Democrat Party, which is one of the main reasons why I left. When you have a party led by people who don't care about the Constitution or our fundamental rights and freedoms, they don't care about peace, they don't care about our civil liberties and rights, what they care about is power and holding on to power and total allegiance not to our country, not to our flag, not to our principles and values that are enshrined in the Constitution. It is allegiance to the party leadership. What does that sound like? Not a democratic republic, not a constitutional republic. It's a banana republic and a dictatorship. And that's why we cannot allow Kamala Harris to win this presidency. Oh! Four years ago, Tulsi was, I think, the deputy director of the DNC. It, it was, a, it was, uh, I, here, here's the short one, and we promise that we'll let you talk. <laughs> I, I was asked to become a vice chair of the Democratic National Committee two weeks after I was, I took my oath of office as a member of Congress. Two weeks. When they called me and said, hey, would you like to do this job? I said, what? What is a vice chair of the DNC? 
what do you really want me to do? The reality was they saw the piece of paper in the picture and they said, oh, she checks all of these identity politics boxes. That'll be good. Little did they know, I think for myself, I'm an independent woo, 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 woo. Ah! And when that call came from the White House, I gotta believe they had a little bit of regret. <laughs> But it was too late. I want to ask you before we... Maybe you better bring me to more of these to take the yeah, focus on my stupidity. About, but I think it's important <laughs> um, to see who is in the room here tonight. I want to see your hand raised if you're a Democrat or a former Democrat or an independent, libertarian. There you go. Well, there are we're so doing many it people across or... our country. And, and I, I just want to say this is, this is uh, of great credit to President Trump that he is doing today what the Democratic Party used to do, which is to welcome people into the cause of freedom, peace, and prosperity so that we can stand together as Americans. Uh, one of the things seemingly that the uh, current, uh, the, 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 the current um, regime uh, doesn't seem to care about are the prices of living, the prices of groceries, the, the prices of childcare. Uh, this is affecting literally every single one of us in every class. What, uh, what would you like to say about how that's going to be handled? What will President Trump do in the policies that he wishes to enact? to bring those prices down, to make sure that we can all actually afford to live in this great country that we love so much. <laughs> you will oh, what did he say? <laughs> no, what did he say? <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> you know, the very first thing before you can fix a problem is you've got to recognize that a problem exists. And this is the thing that has bothered me for so long over these past four years, as the economy has gotten worse, as inflation has gone up, as the price of groceries has gone up, the prices of almost everything, mortgages, interest rates, cost of fuel, cost of car insurance, in almost every respect, the cost of basic necessities that we all use and need in our lives has gone up. And yet over and over again, what we hear from